Hello and welcome to this review of Millennium. It has been out for almost a week now, so I've had enough time to give it a proper go for this review. Now, if you're here just for a quick recommendation, yes or no, the answer from me is yes, if I could only choose from those two options. That isn't enough detail for you, but you're still not sold on watching me analyze this game for however long this video ends up being, then I think at the moment there are some teething issues overall with the new release, relatively major balancing issues, but they're not something that the AI abuses, so if you don't use it against the AI, you'll be fine. Furthermore, I do quite like a lot of the small tweaks and changes they made in the classical Civ formula, as well as some of their major changes, although I must say I would have personally preferred a larger risks being taken overall. My final concern has to be raised over the performance of the game in the late endgame phases, which even on standard size maps starts to take a good few minutes between turns. Overall though, with what the game is now, now, I would give it a 6 out of 10. That's above a 5 and hence the recommendation overall. I would wager that's a couple hundred hours worth of new stuff to explore even for the most seasoned multi-thousand hours veterans. So my recommendation stands. Anyway, time for the major analysis. Before that begins, a like would be appreciated if you haven't already, and a subscription would be amazing. But enough self-shitting, let's begin with a comprehensive review. Now, almost as an immediate disclaimer, just so we're aware, outside of the fact that the simultaneous multiplayer has been confirmed and is going to be coming, I'm going to be reviewing with what I'm looking at in terms of the game here, as in the products that I have right now and not any other future promises. Now, again, I'll be assuming multiplayer is coming because that has been very much confirmed. But if there is some change that is going to be fixed or some major kind of promise that you think that if this happens, it's going to make the game a lot better, well, I'm not going to be considering that as part of the review. The game is here, the game is released, and I'm judging this product well on release. With that said, the first actual change that you're going to notice is basically how they've treated civilizations. So let me just set up a quick uh, custom game so we're aware of it. The actual name of your civilization is entirely cosmetic, be it Rome, Spain, the Ottoman Empire, etc has no actual change on how the game plays so in fact you can go to the nation builder call your nation whatever you want um, pick your little flag that you use out of any of the custom nations and then just pick you know what kind of um, city and town names that you pull from right anyway there is a bonus that you do get that you're kind of almost starting bonus which overall isn't that majorly impactful although some of them are certainly more impactful than others but they're not actually tied to your civilization you can pick them separately so i can play the ottoman power and i can start with the extra improvement points or i can play the ottoman empire and i can start with extra innovation points some of them are a lot better than others without any kind of uh without any repercussion for me personally i find that actually scouts movements tend to be very nice because you're in essence giving your scouts 33 percent more movement because they go from three movement to four that's insane for discovering a lot of extra land but what that does mean is scouts movement is a lot better than something like a naval unit movement homeland early culture as well is a bit of a weird one as things like giving yourself regional production or starting warfare XP or improvement points again they're not that impactful overall you can have a pretty bad bonus and still have a decent game but they are definitely not balanced across each other is the best way of putting it i mean a starting arch unit if you just get swarmed with early barbarians that's kind of the end of it and i think this is probably the other thing where i'm going to mention immediately before we actually go into my continue game they another thing that i'm going to relatively highlight the barbarians in this game are weirdly more threatening is the best way of putting it than what you're used to in civilization but they're very inconsistent in the way they're threatening to you i think the best way of describing this concept is going to be though with the use of numbers but bear in mind this is just how the barbarians feel not with how they're probably hard-coded but what i would say is that if you take a normal Civ game, your Civ 6, Civ 5, and you'd put the Barbarians there, their spawning frequency, if Barbarians are enabled, at a 1, and you'd put Barbarians being turned off at a 0, and you'd put Raging Barbarians at a 2, I'd give these Barbarians in this game around a 1.75 without how aggressive they are on average. However, with that said, there are going to be games where the Barbarians, if they do spawn, are going to be spawning and harassing the AI a lot more than they're going to be harassing you. So there will be situations where you just ignore military and just never deal with Barbarians at all for well the entire game versus some games where the barbarians are going to be swarming you with quite substantial armies like a lot more strength than even the ai will be able to throw at you in the early game so it's an almost a very big inconsistency i'm not even sure if i want to mark that down as a negative it makes the game a lot more dynamic and with how the game is done doing a lot of early fighting isn't actually necessarily a bad thing because you gain a lot of this military xp and we'll get to what the xps and all those others and like exploration experience and so on is so if you are specifically trying to do a military build you actually want to be fighting a lot of barbarians early because that's again free military xp with that said, that's kind of the setup. Let's um, pop into one of the games I have going. Uh, this game, I kind of, um, well, uh, I'll let you see for yourself, but in my capital, I had a early access to a cattle, which when improved gives exploration XP, and I had early access to some nice fish resources. So I kind of went for an exploration tool kind of uh, game. Well, I wasn't spamming that many cities out, and I really wasn't running that many vassals. So this was my capital. This was the early capital I was worked, and when you work, you get exploration XP. 
And you, well, I had a lot of fish for me to work early on as well. In terms of the games and its major, there's going to be a lot of comparisons to Civ. I think it's just going to be disingenuous to shut our eyes and pretend that this game is not within the same genre at a minimum or heavily inspired or whatever you want to call it. I think that's just not a helpful conversation to have if you're not uh, addressing that. There's a lot that it has taken from Civilization, but there's a lot that it has done very differently as well. So let's talk about this now. A good point I would like to start with is actually going to be the tech tree. You have to research three technologies before you move into the next age. And when you do move to the next age, you drag everyone there with you. We'll get to the age system as well in a second. But what I do like with this technology system is that each technology compared to, say, even a civilization is significantly more impactful. For example, when you research defenses, you actually spawn a unit in your homeland. So basically, your homeland is like your when you settle your capital, your capital building, instead of getting a free palace, gets a free home unit. So when you research scouting, for example, you do gain the ability to move through uh, jungle and deep terrain. You do get the access to some lookout building, but you also just have spawner scouting your starting terrain. Workers, when you research this technology, just gives you straight up plus eight improvement points for that. Technologies are inherently a lot more impactful, and I guess that's probably an important thing given how fewer there are of them. With that said, when it comes to technologies, once you research three of them, you can go ahead and go into ages and there's quite a few different ages and honestly that's i think to me is one of the unique things of this game that stands out in a positive way is that the tech tree isn't always going to be the same there's a consistent theme of it of the normal progression from the age of stone you do enter age of bronze but from that point instead of the age of iron you can enter the age of heroes and you do that if you've found at least um three uh, like natural wonders that you've explored. If you found at least three of them, you can go to the Age of Heroes. In the next one, in the Age of Kings, for example, this is basically like your early Middle Ages, is the best way of putting it. You can start entering things like the Age of Discovery. Uh, I can't, we'll explain why in a bit, because I'm locked into the Crisis Age. Oh, and to be clear, there's also the Crisis Age earlier for the Age of Iron. So in, in a weird way, if you're doing badly, you are also being going into another age that kind of deals with that. So for the previous one, if you've had a lot of plagues in your Age of Bronze, you enter the Age of Plagues in the Age of Iron instead. In my case, um, because I had immediately formed, found a religion in this game as soon as I could, and I didn't actually research organized religions, so I couldn't build some holy sites or whatever to satisfy the religious requirements of my population, I immediately started generating loads of intolerance because my religious demand wasn't met, so I kind of locked myself to the Age of Intolerance. Hopefully some other AI actually researches an Age of Renaissance or something, so I'm not locked into the Age of Intolerance myself. But if I am, it's not the end of the world, I just get to explore this part of the tech tree. On first inspection, you may see there's not a lot of text and there's not a lot of variation. But once you take into account the many different ages that you're going to encounter, even as far as just the early Middle Ages, there's a lot going on. And that, for example, for me is definitely a plus one in that it's deep, but not in a way that's overwhelming, especially for when you're just starting out. That's the research thing. Another thing that you'll also be making over time, instead of your little like knowledge points, you'll be also generating something called culture. Culture is not like there's a culture tech tree. Instead, you'll be able to, when you get enough of it, pop something called culture powers. This involves um, creating small towns. So these are like expansions towards your cities. You can create a town to them, or you can, uh, when you get the pioneers can found outposts to absorb them into your territory. The, the borders in this game are a lot more dynamic than pretty much most Civ games at all, and we'll get to the borders in a bit. Or you can do things like local reforms, which basically just buff a region up temporarily a lot. If you really build around coach, you can actually run local reforms 24 7. There's also re Eurekas you can pop for technology, for knowledge, which is there. You can also emergency raise a small army if you desperately need it, or do some powerful things like truce, which immediately terminates all active wars. Just a quick heads up though, with how this game works, this ability would imply that when you do this ability, you'll get a truce so the AI can't just immediately declare war on you. There are no truces in this game. If you sign a white piece, there is absolutely nothing stopping the AI turning around and saying, actually, we're back at war, like the very same next turn. So this ability can be a bit of a double-edged sword in that you think you've just you know, saved yourself, and then it, the AI just declares war on you again. When the game just starts, you only have the government exploration and military powers unlocked, and you unlock more of these as the game goes on, like the art powers for, well, founding and religion. With that said, we move on to your domains. This is the kind of experience that I was talking about earlier. You do start with the government once, um, which is where you'll be able to, well, reform your government. Uh, in this case, for example, I'm running an imperial dynasty government, and there's a whole bunch of governments. They do play quite differently, but overall, they aren't that impactful in their flat things. It's mostly the things going on in their reforms that I found that are the most impactful when you gain government experience, for example, in you build some buildings that give you plus one government XP, or you find some ruins that give you government XP, you can upgrade things, you discover things, same set for the other, for the other things. When you explore things, you find your natural wonders, that's things like these. You can explore them and gain exploration XP, and then there's certain buildings, like for example, building a ranch gives you one exploration XP passively. Earlier on, the civs don't look too dynamic, as you may have noticed, the bustling are very small. How civs do become dynamic is that when you play the game, 
when you enter a new age, you'll be able to pick up an extra domain. So for me, initially, I went with ancient seafarers as other options, and then you'll be able to spend an XP of the specific type. So for example, if you are going for a war domain and a military buffs, you actually probably want a lot of barbarians because then you're getting a lot of warfare XP from fighting them. So you can level up your ancient um, warfare abilities or whatever you end up choosing. And then I also went explorers later because I had a lot of um, exploration XP generation. This is basically how you make your customized civilization each time. You don't automatically day one do something like I'm going to play Byzantium, I'm going to be doing a religious build, I'm going to be abusing XYZ feature. You very much dynamically play around what the train's giving you, what the situation of the world around you has given you. And in the case of multiplayer, if you need to start a military to stop a player, you can build around that as well. The thing is with this XP system, what it actually just means is it turns basically every kind of domain power into its own like a little mini tech pool. You can use to get honestly quite powerful abilities. So the way you get settlers actually is you don't build them. You have to use government progress to spawn settlers. And then that, when you settle them down, actually gives you a vast so which you have to integrate into your land and then spend government power to integrate into your country proper. Same for when you conquer things. With other things like warfare, you can literally spawn your units with volunteers. These are all on cooldown. Or do some really, frankly, powerful stuff, which if this was in vanilla sieve, this would be completely broken. Things like Forced March, where you can fully restore armor movement points to an army at the cost of 10% of each unit's health. That sounds quite bad, you lose 10% health, but you could just restore that straight away with reinforcements. So military XP can be burnt in this way to literally win wars at the cost of losing out military XP for later. Buildings can produce it. In my case, it's not that I haven't really focused on it so in this game, so I'm only getting like five. But for things like engineering, if you want to get the pioneers I mentioned earlier or expand towns, which like levels them up and so on, you can really build around that. And I quite like that as a system. It's basically an extra technology tree. And you unlock more of them as you go on. So in the last stage, for example, I unlocked arts, which has a whole bunch of things going on. Things like immigration, which you can pop to increase the region's population by one, as long as it has less than 10 population is actually quite good overall as a concept but there we go another thing that i think is very much worth mentioning is how this game treats borders because i really like how this game treats borders if you played some of the older civs and actually i mean i think if you just played civilizations full stop because i think even the newest civilizations have a three tile limit what happens is a city like this can even grow or the like i think up to five tiles in civ 5 but you can only work tiles that are three tiles outside of your capital which to me is very arbitrary like if i'm if i'm a citizen of a city why can't I go out and work something four tiles out? With this game, you can. There are actually no limits to how large a city can go. Like a citizen from here can work this tile. I mean, they'll get one food from it. So I'm not sure why I'd want to work that tile, but it can work that tile. But what it, what happens instead is that each city generates a little bit of influence from it. So you see Amara is generating influence passing to all the tiles around it. And it takes... Um, a, but until it fills up this influence bar is when it expands towards these slots, if that makes sense. You can also manually expand it by putting down towns. So for example, we're down this outpost here in the desert because it's really not growing to this desert. Deserts are very expensive to grow towards as it turns out. So eventually I can, when I use the government power, I'm sorry, when I use the culture power to absorb an outpost, I can absorb this outpost and this will become part of my borders, which means it's quite a dynamic border system and it tends to grow towards things you actually want to grow. It also means that if you have something like this tuna fish here that I want to work in my capital, but it happens to be three tiles out, I'm not just screwed over, which I find quite good. It just means that I can keep working things like that. Even if it's four tiles out, there's an arbitrary condition of cutoff point. It just takes longer to grow towards tiles that are further away from you. And of course, some terrain like forest takes longer to grow through uh, versus for me, because within, for example, in my ancient seafarers built, one of the things that they uh, done is reduce the cost of expansion to water and deep water. So for me, I need a lot less influence to grab each water tile than I would normally. So I expand a bit like this a lot more aggressively is through the water tiles because of my government choices. And again, very dynamic system, which I do appreciate. With that said, what that can mean with the border system is that unless you're talking about the initial like eight tiles that you put down, because you can just put down an outpost like Spain did in this game right here as an AI, when they go to this tile, because you need to board your outpost, you can just annex things like this. I just annex all of this land into you, uh, which can be a bit weird and arbitrary. So borders are a lot more fluid, which can be a good or a bad thing. With that, let's now talk about towns. For me, I think this is the part where I have to say, okay, this system probably wants a bit of work. When you get a level one town, it can grow around it and more towns upgrade the regional level so it can do better than bigger things. That's like its mechanic. It's basically how developed a region is, for lack of a better word. But this, what I have here is a lumber town. Lumber towns get plus one production. So, for example, mining towns, to be clear, get production for each adjacent money improvement. Farming towns get extra food for each adjacent farming improvement and that kind of thing. As you can see, I've planned out a an eventual farming town to put down here. What that means is that I've put down a lumber town here, which gets plus one production from each adjacent lumber mill. 
I then put down four lumber mills next to it. Now I don't have the population to work those lumber mills. We'll get into this menu in a bit. These forest lumber mills, as you can see here, are, all of them are unworked. It's just the fact that there are just four lumber mills that no one attends to near this town, give it formal production, which is quite powerful. Now, of course, these improvements still cost improvement points, which is kind of their replacement to workers, for lack of a better word. So it's not like you can do this for free, but it's not like I'm sacrificing much. And it kind of takes away from the old adage of population as power because I can just extract production out of the void. It also means that because towns are very powerful to place, for example, next to three mines in this town I placed here for plus three production, or this random town I put here, it's kind of almost, dare I say, unrealistic. Because if I had this major metropolis here, it'd probably be getting a town like here or here or even this town here. This is a very realistic place of getting a small town and expansion for. Instead, your actual towns tend to be placed surrounded conveniently by many forests or this town here, which makes no sense being next to a virus. I mean, it's an apple seven of zombie, yeah, but it's just surrounded next to a lot of hills. So you'll make a good town. And I think that's probably worth a mention. It's kind of a, it's kind of a weird situation to be in that. You, you don't place towns where they would make sense normally. You place towns where they are next to very specific conditions, like being around forests for the adjacency bonuses. So let's get back into the city management. And the first thing I have to say, which I actually really, really love, is how pop growth is handled. Initially, when you have a brand new settlement, I'm not sure if Tannis is actually good enough for this. Yeah, so Tannis is a very small settlement, so it doesn't have many conditions meant to. Uh, so it doesn't have unlocked extra conditions for growth, and you unlock more conditions the larger you grow. Initially, the only condition you need is food. The way that works is you have an amount of food that you need to grow, so that to eat, so four citizens require eight food, that's fine. But let's say you produce 12 food, you, you produce 150% of the food you need, so you grow faster. What that also means is that if I go and produce, say, 163% food, yeah, sure, I'm growing faster, but once I hit that 200% food, so I oversupply you with food. 200% is the cap. I can't get any more growth. See, if I'm getting like 300% of the food I need, I'm still not growing 300% faster compared to, say, a Civ game where I would be growing 300% faster, which it kind of self caps really good starts. What that means is that if you do get an insane spawn with like 10 tuna, which is really good food early game, it's five food early game. What that does mean is that if you get some really good luck early game, you don't immediately run away with the game because you're still capped on the max amount of food you can produce to turn into well growth. And it also means that if you are a bit behind and that you don't have an amazing start, you're not that far behind because as long as you're getting something like 150, 160%, you'll only be some bits of growth behind someone on literally the best perfect start with 200% food. It's almost as an equalizer. And I think capping that in that way is a good thing. Now, if you go to a more major development city here, as you can see, it starts requiring housing, which you can build by putting down more houses, sanitation, religious demands and luxury demands. The thing is that I quite enjoy about luxury demands is luxury demands are never less than 100% satisfied. The other things can be below 100% and those start creating problems for you. If you don't have enough food, you start starving. If you don't have enough religion, you start entering, you know, periods of intolerance and having other issues like that. It's something that you do want to address, for lack of a better word. So for example, in Memphis, very good sanitization, very good housing and all that. So it's, it's growing quite nicely, even if it doesn't have inherently that much food. And it also means that if you have a relatively reasonably developed region and you want to really invest in its growth, you can just put down a bunch of housing and sanitation to help you along in that way, disproportionately more than you just to get help it grow. And I think that's a nice change and dynamic change. With that said, let's now talk about the good system in this game. And I actually quite like the system. It's um it's something that I think was really missing in a lot of Civ games in that if you work a forest tile, you produce lumber, I'm assuming, and that's just hammers. That there we go. Everything gets converted into hammers or shields for the for the older Civ games. And things for like you just work gold that can gets converted to gold. And if you work iron that can gets converted to production and that's it. There's no dynamic system to it. It still can be. So for example, um, if I'm working these shells, um, I can still convert these shells that I'm working straight into I can consume a shell for three food with three money and one food. So if I have a person producing a shell, I can do that. Or I can build a shell die which will convert one of these shells into a die, which generates a lot more money and some exploration experience me on the side as well. So it kind of creates a dynamic like progression system. And these tend to actually get quite deep. So for example, if I look at my capital at the moment, I have the foresters, which are producing three lumber, uh, three logs, which I can uh, convert each log into two production. But what I'm doing is I'm taking those logs and I'm going to the paper maker and I'm converting each log into one paper, which is converting it away from production into money. But then I'm actually going to the scribe and I'm getting each piece of paper to be converted into one knowledge or one science. There are other systems like that to be put around. For example, I have some bay pits, which my clay out of the ground gives me a production improvement point. And then you have a kiln that turns that clay into bricks, which doubles them from one production, one improvement point to two productions, two improvement points. And there we go. It's a dynamic system in that regard almost, which I think is a nice change that's missing. Another like example of this that I thought was quite cool was in Avaris. Um, I mine copper 
I then convert those copper into ingots for the furnace. And then I turn those ingots into tools. And what that means is that this copper, which I could claim for two production, gets converted into... So one copper gets converted to an ingot, which is five production. And then because I have two ingots, I can convert those two ingots, which are five production each, into two tools, which are now 16 production. So 4x improvement through this processing chart. Next, of course, with these goods is trade is a lot more dynamic than just... I shove a merchant that sends four food and four production south by empire. You can do domestic imports and exports. This can get a bit tedious by the late game, by the way, so that's just a fair warning. But what it also means is that let's say I, in this city, produce a lot of bread. So I have my wheat and I'm plowing it down to flour and then I'm turning that flour into bread just 10 whole food. I can export, at the moment I'm, exp I'm not bothered with that, so I'm just exporting common goods for culture buffs. I can export bread into Memphis. And if we take a look at Memphis right now, if I were to go back to this thing and I would export bread to Memphis, I would lose 10 food in Avaris because I have one less bread than I'm consuming. But Memphis now has gained a lot more food because it's importing this bread that I've sent earlier and it's consuming it. Which also means that when you do set up a new region, you can take one of your heavy production spaces like this, like the Stoolsmith, which is making a lot of production, and send it to that new region, which can help it develop a lot faster. This is one of the issues I have with Civ games, is that if you set up a city very late in the game, it takes it forever to catch up in terms of developments and buildings compared to your other main cities. So almost incentivized to not bother. And this kind of acts as a very nice natural catch-up mechanism which I have to appreciate and also lets you really focus on it if you're building a wonder or something to be able to quite literally export production or export food into your capital whatever you may need I think is quite a nice system and a very welcome addition to this game uh, definitely a plus one for me with that said again my main issue is it can get quite tedious in terms of its management I'm not sure how to address that concern I'm not offering a solution I'm just pointing out that it does get tedious let's now talk about warfare one of the things that I quite like about warfare is initially with civilization games you could stack multiple units on the same tile or the older civs but what that means they'll still fight one at a time which was a bit weird let's say you have three warriors fighting one warrior they'd go and fight the enemy warrior one at a time which was weird and of course it made front lines very difficult because you just put all your troops in one stack and have a death stack or around with civ 5 they one of the big changes they've done is they of course made it where each unit took a tile so you couldn't stack units on top of each other unless they were like workers stacking with warriors but what that has also again meant is that it was a bit weird how one unit of warriors took up an entire tile an entire city's worth of space furthermore with civ 6 you can now build armies which are basically just all cores which are like up to three units of the same type when you have the appropriate technology all fighting together at the same time with much significantly increased combat strength from that but they have to be the same unit the combat system in this game is already a lot more weirdly dynamic for lack of a better word in that you can combine any units into any kind of army so for example here i have two crossbows and two spears and they make a four strong army now you can only put three units initially but as you research more technologies, so for example, in the age of, uh, I believe, bronze with discipline, you can increase your maximum army size to four units. And then in this deco, oh, I need to grab construction, actually. I believe in professional armies, you can I can increase that up to five units. Those units fight together, and they fight together dynamically in the sense that, of course, there's still the rock, paper, scissors old mechanics of spearmen are good against horses, and horses are good against archers, and archers are good against, you know, uh, land infantry and that kind of thing. It's, you know, relatively normal rock, paper, scissors scenarios. But that can now impact your army composition. So... For example, in here, this army has your frontline infantry and two crossbows behind it kind of thing. And then this army here has a leader. We'll get back to those in a minute. I mean, okay, we could just cover them now. If you have a unit that does really well and it gets a lot of promotions, you can promote it into a leader and it basically just gets an extra tactic bonus to the units inside of it. The one weird concern with leaders is they don't inherit the movement speed of the previous unit. So for example, let's say you had four cavalry units. Those four cavalry units went on campaign. They had the extra movement for being cavalry. One of them you promote to a leader. A leader is inherently a, uh, you've got the movement speed of an infantry unit of well 20 in this case so you've just slowed down in your entire cavalry army because there's a, a guy that's choosing to not be on a horse walking around with your army not on a horse which is a bit weird and i'm assuming will get changed but again i'm reviewing the game which in its current state and that's one thing that's very much missing but what that does mean again from being able to combine units into one kind of stack that fights together which is a nice change is we're back to the relative civ 3 problem i find or the other pre you know, stacking games the Civilization series, where it's very hard to have a front line or even choke points because you can just walk around enemy unit armies. You either spread your armies out, in which case they do cover the terrain. So I can spread out these units to cover the terrain, as it were, and have like a little front line established if I were to fight the Germans. So I could, you know, have these five units over here. But of course, with five units over here, they could each easily get smacked silly by a German army that's combined five units into one stack. What that does mean, of course, is that I have to keep my armies directly separated and then almost respond to enemy movements by moving my army out to fight kind of thing so i don't i'm not saying that's a bad thing in fact i quite like that dynamic relative combat system but it's something that you have to be very aware of just a heads up enemy armies can use your roads actually i'm not sure if they can maybe they're just zooming around my territory earlier i'm not actually 100 sure on that and i'm yet to invade anyone in this game so i'll be honest i haven't 
actually tried offensive uh, moves against the AI. I've just been mainly building around doing that. So roads are, by the way, done in the Civ 6 style, where when you put them down, they can, they automatically connect. So the outpost when I put it down, automatically created a road between these spaces, and cities automatically create roads between them and towns. So so it's quite nice you don't have to bother building roads, but things tend to be self-connected but not road on every tile with that said that's kind of the main part of the combat system there are definitely some units which are a lot better than others there's definitely a lot of fun strategies you can use for example one thing that you can definitely do in terms of its overpowered broker strategies is have your main capital sure but then spam out settlers and never actually annex them so you end up with a lot of vassal territories so to be clear madrid here as you can see by the borders is a vassal territory of spain so you have all these little small vassals they can't build inside vassals so they're not very useful but they still build up prosperity and they give you a little bit of tribute there's a government type uh for the feudal uh age where you can basically get a lot more value out of those tributaries and it gives you a culture interaction which increases the population in all of your vassals by one it has no cap so you can just sit there spamming the culture ability and get like 40 population vassals which are incredibly powerful spamming you out things then there's another age there's a, there's another government ability within that thing which makes every single vassal you have spawn like two or three units and when you spam out like 20 of them that becomes very frankly overpowered because you basically just get a swarm of well, levies that you could just throw at anyone with that we've covered the military aspect of the game which overall is a plus one to me with how the dynamic army is thrown out and fight we've covered the research and cultures and the internal tabs so there's not too much else left to cover apart from well how much fun is it within each domain i would say the early game where there's not that much going on is their exploration heavy which is fair but it can get a bit repetitive i think this game in terms of its enjoyment really peaks in basically where I am right now, where you've entered your early middle ages, you've entered the age of iron, you've set up your game, you kind of know what you're going for this game already, and you are ready to basically play around that a lot more. Um, there's a lot more trade goods for you to do, there's a lot more new unlocked buildings and so on for you to build. You know, you've actually figured out the ironsmith to convert your copper into ingots and turn it into tools. Or, for example, if I didn't want to do that, I can go and um, build a, a metalwork thing for a weaponsmith uh, and then I can convert my ingots into spears which is straight up warfare experience and so on. Another thing I should probably also mention these things that require being built are built with these improvement points. They can be generated with clay mines um, with clay early on which everyone has access to. You can just put that anywhere the clay pits or you can go into your cities and you can convert some of your production some point instead of building a building into levy workers where you can levy it into product into improvement points and you can do this from pretty much the first technology it's kind of almost instead of building workers you levy workers uh, here uh, when you research the workers technology so that it's a very dynamic improvement system where you can build buildings that build it passively and i recommend you do that quite good for improving the outside terrain around you but if you find yourself running behind on it you can just sit down stop reducing other buildings and catch up on your improvements in terms of enjoyment back to that definitely we'll have to say i think the best part of this game in terms of enjoyment is once you start entering the Age of Iron and you start getting a lot of your trade goods going and you start going into these things, you started really customizing your nation, you start unlocking things like religion. For me, that's when the game really starts to peak. And this is also from the Age of Kings where you can unlock the first victory objective, the Age of Conquest. It's a weird calculation, I'm not sure how the game does it, but if you have 150% relative strength to the second greatest power, you can go to the Age of Conquest and you have until that age to, well, conquer the world. And if you do, you win the game. Congratulations. It's the first victory condition. Then later on, you start discovering getting other condition, victory conditions like your science victory that you're used to your culture victories that you're used to but those involve meeting conditions and entering ages which means that at no point should you ever really be behind on science that's a very big thing that you want to make sure you keep a track of because if an ai enters like the age of renaissance and you haven't gone into the age of conquest that gets screwed over because you're forced into the age of renaissance and if you are in the age of conquest and you're trying to conquer the world but then an ai enters the next stage you've lost your opportunity to win the game that way kind of thing this game is a lot less forgiving if you are behind in terms of comeback things there's a lot of self-scaling where the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer in the sense that if you aren't doing great you do start getting punished for it with disasters this if you have a lot of unrest for example you start to accumulate chaos there are some events that give you chaos and they can be quite difficult to deal with if you can't do them and i think that's a cool system the other thing i have to say is i think the chaos idea where if you if this builds up enough to 100 you start getting a chance getting to a disaster i think that's a really cool idea it needs to be actually more punishing because it's very easy in this game to make boatloads of money this is boatloads of money and what that does mean is that when a chaos starts you can just pay the crisis off it's not that expensive uh last time i paid a crisis off it was around 650 gold so if you're rich enough you can basically avoid all bad things happening to you the other thing with that as well is you do get this innovation mechanics which you accumulate over time as well so being the first nation to enter an age you get innovation and so on and so on and eventually when you do get enough of it you get some very nice events where you can either get a bunch of money or you can unlock some extra abilities uh so for example one of the innovations i got was getting plus one food out of my uh, shells 
so before they were generating three buffs, now they generate three buffs and a few small things like that, which I think are neat. And again, from a game designer point of view, though, you have to be a bit careful because it means that countries that are doing well are going to be starting doing even better and kind of running away with the game. You basically don't want to be losing here. It's very hard to play this game from the back. And I think that's something that should be bear in mind when you are considering this game. Okay, I think that's about that in terms of its overall things. Now let's start talking about the lane game. And I think it's a bit imperative to talk about the lane game. It's a bit hard to talk about the lane game without mentioning the big major thing with it. This is optimized very badly. And I think compared to every other issue that we mentioned earlier that could be tweaked with game design decisions or even not, optimization has to happen at the start. You have to build the game with optimization in mind. Now, I don't have a bad computer. And I also had a couple of friends who tried this game out on much better computers than mine. And they all did run into these issues. The game really struggles that game. We're talking multiple turns, noticeable lag later on in the game it's not as easy as just saying optimize the game for the game to suddenly turn around and say well i guess i'm optimized now it's going to be a relatively permanent issue that you know is going to be ruining your enjoyment of the game because it can still turn around it can still go one day and become hyper optimized and in that case, if it does, I'll be ecstatic. I'll be very happy if that does happen. But I'm also, again, reviewing the game I currently have, and I'm very unoptimistic with its prospects in terms of its optimization. Now, again, the other thing to bear in mind is this game did come out pretty much just under a week ago. Depends on when you're watching this. So there's a lot of things that could be... that definitely deserve being ironed out. I think the game still was playing despite those issues. But, for example, leaders inheriting the movement speed of their previous armies. So if you have a cavalry army, your leader actually having the correct movement speed to make up for that, so your leader isn't dragging your armies down behind it and another major thing that i think really has to be mentioned is you can't raise cities this game not sure if you've ever had the issue in civilization 5 for example when you're running around and you discover this perfect spot to put down your city then you walk two more tiles and you see a city state just slightly off from it which both isn't in a good spot because the city state isn't in a perfect spot but it's also ruining your settlement option well not only can you not raise city state cities in this game so for example something like this has been a city state or neutral territory whatever you want to call it i think it's more of a neutral city state but a city if if that makes sense because there's no city state interaction mechanics for it really um, not only can you not raise cities you also can't raise any brain dead ai city placements so madrid is going to be here forever either i own it or it's owned by someone else that's just a given valencia will always exist here now I, I i can never do anything about valencia existing pretty much and if an ai walks here and puts a city here and completely screws up the connectedness of this entire part of my empire. At best, I can just capture the city. I can never burn the city to the ground. But the main point still stands. There, it's a relatively new game. So there are going to be some teething issues like not being able to burn cities. Or I guess it's relatively fixed now, but hovering UI has been a bit weird. But overall, though, with all of that being said, there's still a lot of really cool changes. I personally love this trade good system being able to like really customize and go in depth of what your city is actually doing and set up these production chains be able to export them you unlock more of these domestic exports and import slots by the way as time goes on i think that system is really cool and i quite enjoy that and i think it's honestly missing from sim games i quite like the army changes i love the border changes the fact that even though this tile is five cities out or five tiles away uh, from my capital i can still technically work this tile i don't need to set settle an entire new city just because i want to work these fish and then again there's a lot of other things that have changed like dynamic borders so for example influence grows towards these tiles being part of the city that's all great i think that's there and with that said i think overall that still deserves at least some place for your part anyway thank you very much for enjoying the extensive part of this review i hope you uh, i hope you learned something new today i hope you enjoyed the video thank you, thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next one goodbye